Sportive nationalism uh, is the idea that it is important for a country to produce uh, high caliber athletes who can succeed internationally on the global stage and represent the nation well. Uh, I think that ultimately this is a fantasy about national security. That if you don't produce athletes who can compete with the other great athletes, uh, somehow this is a mark against the nation from which they come. So I think that there's, there is a, a powerful and primitive fantasy that um, involves elite athletes as representatives of national vitality. And of course, this uh, belief has consequences. Uh, it sustains uh, National Olympic committees all over the world. Uh, it sustains interest in sports that enlists uh, millions of corporate dollars in sponsorships for leagues and federations and teams, athletes, etc. So this is a very powerful idea. Sportive nationalism is literally a global doctrine. There are very few, if any, nations on earth, and there are about 200 of them, uh, that would voluntarily opt out of playing the international sports game. Uh, it is a way of belonging to the world. Even if you are a tiny island nation uh, in the middle of the Pacific, uh, chances are the World Anti-Doping Agency has persuaded you to set up um, a national anti-doping organization in order to allow you to participate uh, in the Olympic Games. So this is, this is globe-girdling stuff. I think most people around the world are going to watch uh, the World Cup if they have a team that's participating uh, as an enjoyable, uh, suspenseful way uh, of, of following their representatives on the global stage. I think that's the, the basic uh, experience of the World Cup. And I think it's the most important experience that, that people have. I mean, originally, the idea of world sport as imagined and carried through, as a matter of fact, by the founder of uh, the International Olympic Committee, the, the Frenchman Pierre de Coubertin, he had two basic ideas. One was that sports could reconcile the social classes within France uh, and bring a certain kind of political peace. The more enduring idea that is still being lived out uh, in the Olympic movement uh, primarily is the idea that if you can get nations to compete against each other peacefully, then this represents a contribution to the establishing of world peace. Uh, I guess that's why George Orwell said that uh, sport is war minus the shooting. Uh, at least th that's the fantasy. And there is this assumption that if you can assemble uh, a peaceful competition uh, on an international basis, that this is somehow good for the world and that it is going to uh, mitigate political conflicts. Unfortunately, when you look back at recent history, it turns out it doesn't work that way. The Olympic century was the 20th century, which was also the bloodiest century in human history. When you are talking or thinking about sports and its relation to politics, you always have to factor in the human imagination, wishful thinking. What is going to make people feel good when they experience this conjunction of great sports performance uh, and the whole issue of political identity uh, and political power. Uh, it's, it's a very fantasy-charged uh, area of human experience. I think, I think there are at least two big topics uh, here. One is the bread and circuses aspect. As a matter of fact, it was only days ago uh, that the New York Times published a very interesting op-ed by a well-known uh, Mexican writer claiming that the Mexican government, for which he has no respect whatsoever, 
actually scheduled in June of this year certain political maneuvers that coincided with the period that a big part of the Mexican population would be watching uh, the World Cup. So there, I mean, there is, you know, the possibility for sort of the devious use uh, of a World Cup. Do politicians around the world hope that successful athletes are going to bring them reflected glory? Yes, they do. Uh, but that talk about wishful thinking uh, is, is easier said than done. The more important uh, economic factor here from my standpoint is reflected in the massive protests that went on for months before the World Cup in Brazil. And this was possibly unique, certainly in its scope in terms of social protests directed against uh, the sheer expense of putting on uh, a World Cup or an Olympiad. Apparently, the Brazilian government spent $11 billion on this World Cup. And guess what? In 2016, they're supposed to put on the Olympic Games as well. Uh, these are projects that date, I suppose, uh, from some years back when the Brazilian economic curve was going up uh, as opposed to, to flattening out the way it is now. But in any case, the, the principle involved in spending mega sums of money on this sort of a spectacle when you've got countless millions of people who are living in poverty, who are living without the hospitals, without the schools, who have raw sewage running through their streets, etc. From my standpoint, uh, as a rather consistent critic of the, the power elites who run world sport, the Brazilian protests were long overdue. Uh, and it's about time that people wake up to the real world consequences of vast, vast overspending on these projects. Vladimir Putin spent $50 billion on a two week Winter Olympiad back in February of 2014. That's obscene. When you look at the state of the Russian population just in health terms and what the needs of those people are, and you think of this political egomaniac spending $50 billion on a two-week athletic event that is supposed to represent his grandeur first and then the grandeur of the nation, that there is something very disordered about that. I'll give you one more example. In 2004, who held the Summer Olympic Games? It was the Greeks in Athens. They started with an estimate around maybe $3 billion. This is Greece, mind you, okay? The, the economic sick man of Europe for years and years. It ballooned to $12 billion. This is a country of 11 million people. Uh, it is not one of the wealthy countries. And now, of course, it's a disaster zone. It's a society that has been coming apart for years because of the austerity measures. Why the austerity measures? Because of massive, massive debt. Did spending $12 billion on the 2004 Summer Olympic Games do anything for Greece apart from accelerating the expanding debt to the detriment of, of the nation as a whole? I rather doubt it. So it's easy to cover the sports events at an Olympiad. It is easy to cover the soccer games at the World Cup. What is more challenging and probably more significant is to cover the economic dimensions, the machinations, the damage uh, that is done by holding these events that are assumed to have a great deal of prestige value, but that can be very harmful to large numbers of people in the countries in which they are held. I think that is 99% nonsense. Mm -hmm. here, here is an example. Uh, before the 2010 World Cup was played in South Africa, you had uh, European economists having fantasies about what a Spanish victory in the World Cup was going to do for that economy. 
and they actually were predicting a, you know, a percent tick upwards or, or something like that, uh, just because people were going to feel better. People were going to feel better, and that meant that they were going to spend more. There was going to be some sort of magical effect. Well, of course, the history of the Spanish economy uh, since 2010 doesn't have much to do with growth. I mean, they, they had uh, this implosion of the housing market. You've got 25% unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. My point is that fantasies about the uh, imagined positive effects on a country, a body politic, that are associated with glorious athletic victories uh, are powerful fantasies, but they are misleading fantasies. They're what I call sports legendary effects in the political world. Uh, attractive fantasies that can rarely be reconciled with reality on the ground. Here is uh, a topic uh, that I and uh, at least some others find interesting with regard uh, to, say, this World Cup. It is brought to us by the International Football Federation, FIFA, uh, which is including um, positive advertising about itself throughout the broadcast. Well, FIFA is a famously corrupt organization. Uh, Josef Blatter, uh, who is the longtime uh, head of FIFA and at the age of 79 wants to run for a fifth term, uh, either this year or next year, is a person uh, who has been reliably connected to bribes from a certain defunct country, et cetera, et cetera. He has certainly bought his presidency by uh, handing out money to uh, various delegations, uh, usually the, the many, many delegations from poor places. You have to understand that if you want to be the president of, of a world sports federation, most of your membership is going to be small countries that, that have little or no money. Uh, and co-opting the voting delegates of those countries uh, has not been very difficult for any number of world federations. Okay. What's interesting is that Josef Zepp Blatter, the head of FIFA, has made world headlines uh, in the area of corruption year after year after year. And for those uh, few of us who follow this professionally, uh, you, you sit on the edge of your seat and you say to yourself, this time, he's got to go. This time, it's going to be too much. Uh, this time, the Swiss prosecutor is going to get his act together. Uh, and Zepp Blatter is, is no longer going to be the head of FIFA. But that isn't the way it works. And it doesn't work that way because Zepp Blatter, the head of FIFA, is accountable to no one except the voting membership which he has already bought off. It's very interesting. The head of FIFA, the president of the International Olympic Committee, the Pope, the Secretary General of the United Nations, these are truly international or global uh, independent figures. So that those of us who follow the political and financial career of the Zepp Blatters of the world uh, are aware that moral outrage uh, about his persisting in this position as a corrupt and compromised person, it's ineffective because he is accountable to no one other than the voting membership. Uh, he would have to do terrible, terrible things. Uh, to be dislodged from his position. And there are any number of other examples of very powerful sports officials, heads of international sports federations of major sports. It's the same thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a mini mafia. And you get some very uh, sleazy 
and ethically compromised people holding powerful positions year after year because uh, they are accountable uh, to no one. I, I'm, I'm thinking of a moment uh, when I was watching the World Cup the other night and the camera goes to the head of FIFA, Zepp Blatter. And interestingly, I didn't hear a word come out of the announcer's mouth. You show him, uh, normally, you know, if it's an NFL owner who was shown on television during a game, you say, well, there is, is Mr. Smith, uh, the billionaire, uh, who is very good to his many uh, charitable organizations, and there is his lovely wife, and there he is sitting next to Senator so-and-so. You can show a picture of Zepp Blatter, but you don't want to narrate the backstory because the backstory is too dirty. He gets his five seconds of global television, but interestingly, he gets it anonymously. One of the, one of the things you have to understand about a lot of uh, the kingpins that run sports globally um, is that they have no ethics of significance. Uh, it's all about brand. It's all about power. It's all about control. Uh, in some cases, it will be about money. Uh, very often, I think it's about what I call psychic income. The ability to be there on the world stage shaking the hands of presidents and prime ministers and meeting the celebrities and hanging out with the athletic celebrities who may be even bigger celebrities than the politicians and just drinking it all in and feeling important because the international sports stage is in all likelihood the only stage on which these people could possibly star, could possibly distinguish themselves in a way that's going to bring them that much attention. It's an ethics-free zone in many cases. There would be far, far more accountability. I mean, accountability, I mean, I'm glad you used that word because accountability is uh, precisely what they are not held to because they get to dictate the rules of the game. Uh, they have an entertainment product that is valued by huge corporations of means, such as NBC, for example. And so you have a situation where uh, no matter how you know, dirty or compromised uh, or ethically dubious uh, the, the people and, and their behaviors, as in the case of uh, FIFA and the foreign laborers who are dying like flies in Qatar, as, as the, the Qataris spend a couple of hundred billions of dollars uh, preparing for what may or may not be uh, the World Cup of 2022. I mean, this is, it's an open scandal. And it's another opportunity for FIFA to say, we must do something about this. These are intolerable conditions, but of course the conditions have not changed. This has been massively reported. Uh, the Gulf states are in a way, in terms of indentured servitude and uh, poverty stricken laborers who don't even get to keep their passports, they're semi-slave states. But that, uh, and Putin is running uh, more and more uh, a dictatorship and, and more and more of a vicious dictatorship. That does not stop FIFA from voting uh, the, the World Cup to Vladimir Putin. Uh, the absolute monarchy that runs Qatar uh, is not an obstacle for FIFA picking them uh, to stage the 2022 World Cup in, in steaming desert conditions with temperatures of 110, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people sit back and say, well, 
how did that happen? Uh, does it really make sense for them to spend uncounted billions of dollars on stadia that are going to be white elephants 10 seconds after the last game is played? I mean, this is, this is insanity. Uh, but it's a certain kind of insanity that plays in the global sports world because there are no checks and balances. There is no one to whom the absolute monarch of Qatar is accountable other than himself. I know about this firsthand. I've done a lot of sports journalism. And a friend of mine happens to be uh, the number one uh, sports investigative journalist in the world. In fact, he has been uh, helping to drive the protests in Brazil. He's been collaborating with them. He, you will almost, his name is Andrew Jennings. He is the one who wrote uh, The Lords of the Rings. He is the one who outed Samaranch, the Spanish fascist, et cetera, et cetera. I've known Andrew for 20 years, and he's still at it, by the way. He's 70 years old. Um, you will almost never see Andrew's name mentioned in an American newspaper. And the reason, in my opinion, is because he's an embarrassment to American sports writers, because he has outperformed all of them put together. He is the one who travels the world and goes to these these, you know, malaria-infested places in order to do the interviews to confirm the payoffs from the delegate of country X to Zepp Blatter or whoever it may be. Andrew's the one uh, who has put together uh, the case against FIFA in two books. Um, Andrew is uh, a non-entity in American sports journalism. Again, I think because uh, he, he's an embarrassment. If you start reporting Andrew's results, then you sort of, by implication, incur an obligation to work as hard as Andrew does. And no, none of these people want to do that. Yeah. They, so the, 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 this, has been, this has been an element of frustration for me for a long time. There have been two occasions when I've tried to give material to the New York Times, okay? Um, they weren't interested. And so in the second case, I published it myself in the Atlanta paper. It was the best investigative thing I've ever done. And as a matter of fact, I got the information out of three UT libraries to do this. Um, so, don't tell me that, that the, American, the American news media are reporting what needs to be known about the corruption of various kinds that occurs in the sports world. As a matter of fact, where did the uh, slave labor in Qatar on behalf of the World Cup coverage come from? It came from The Guardian. Okay, it came from the Guardian, mm -hmm. and then there's a gap period, and then somebody at the New York Times will say, hmm, I guess that ought to be. There's no, there's very, very little investigative uh, journalism in the sports field in the American press. No, there's, there are, well, um, there are ways to check the IOC and FIFA, but they have nothing to do with ethical standards. If the networks decide that the IOC or FIFA have done something so awful that it is going to be bad for business, then you are going to uh, see the networks, or conceivably governments that are so embarrassed uh, by IOC or FIFA behavior that they simply can't take it. Uh, or in the case of the Moscow boycott of 1980, the Olympic boycott that Jimmy Carter set in motion. Um, Jimmy Carter decided in December of 79 that the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was simply too much. And so, 
through his sheer power, through uh, manhandling the United States Olympic Committee and, and, and basically bullying them. I mean, I supported that boy. I'm the last person who supports the Moscow boycott. But the fact of the matter is that the Carter administration muscled the USOC into voting not to go to Moscow. In that case, uh, the American government really had an impact on the IOC's operations. There were something like 56 nations that didn't go. You were flying the UN flag or something like that rather than the national flag, you know, playing Beethoven's Ode to Joy instead of the, uh, yeah, from a certain standpoint, it was a mess. Uh, it was very, very different. Uh, a government had an impact on the Olympic Games. That was a very great exception to the rule. So the, it is only great political or economic force that can uh, intercede with business as usual uh, at the IOC uh, or business as usual at FIFA. Uh, and again, look at the example of FIFA. Years and years of terrible headlines and yet the man in charge is still in charge, and he is talking credibly at the age of 79 about going for a fifth term. My answer is that this World Cup is going to generate a lot of entertainment value. And that is the end of my answer. So the question becomes, and it's a serious question, what is the value of entertainment? Uh, and the more I think about it, uh, the more important it can be. If I get hooked on a quality television series, that really adds something to my life, unquestionably. Watching great soccer, can add something to the lives of countless people. The question is, how do you characterize the benefit? The, there is not going to be much of an economic benefit except for a very small number of people who are invested, literally, in a financial sense. The political rewards, if any, are largely incalculable or non-existent or simply imagined. I think it comes back to the serious question of what is good entertainment worth to us and what does good entertainment add to our experience as human beings.